It's fight time, and you're watching the new home of boxing, Box Nation. Just take it back. We'll do a, hopefully a history of detailing the two of you and how your histories are so interlinked. Now, Emmanuel, you are an outstanding amateur in your own right, winning the National Golden Gloves title, but why did you forego your professional career and turn to training? I forgo my uh, professional potential and ambitions because I couldn't get what I felt was a proper manager. Uh, you know, I was pretty good in amateurs. I could win national championships, but I know in the professional boxing, there's people who make dental meetings and uh, decisions who decide your career. And I couldn't find the type of a manager who I could either trust or either he was competent. So I actually ended up uh, just uh, quitting boxing temporarily. And I began working for Detroit Edison as a lineman. I got married when I was 19. And uh, eventually I ended up back into boxing on the weekends and in the evenings as more as a hobby. And one thing led to another. And the little kids that I was involved with uh, coaching at the time uh, pretty soon got to be 18 years old. And Thomas Harris was the first one. And so that is how we got into the professional boxing. So actually when Thomas Hearns turned professional, I was really turning professional also and as a manager. And the next thing you know, it was a succession of every one of the current kids when they turned 18, they all wanted to fight professional. And Milton McCroy, Jimmy Paul, and that began the string of uh, Kronk amateur to professional fighters. Staying with the Kronk and the gym that you became so synonymous with, Two most distinctive names are the name itself, two most distinctive things are the name itself and the distinctive colors. How did those two things come into being? Well, in 1971, I had a group of my kids who had joined the Marines. And so they came back and they gave me their robes that I could use since I didn't have much supplies and outfits for the kids. And the colors were red and gold. And prior to that, the crunk colors was blue and gold. So therefore, we ended up with a combination of the original crunk colors, which was blue and gold, and the marine colors. So that's how we ended up with the red and gold and blue. And the name itself, where did that come from? Very distinctive sounding name. The name crunk was a name that was named uh, as a recreation center in the middle of a community, which was in the past years back was a Polish uh, community and neighborhood. And it was named after John F. Crunk. He was just a local politician who was very popular uh, he was a Polish uh, guy, and whenever he could get money or sources uh, in his political job, he would always try to use it to build up that and improve the quality of that recreation center. So they named the center John F. Kronk, and it's just a regular little dilapidated building on the southwest side of Detroit, which at this time is primarily in the Mexican and the Arab neighborhood. It's right close to Dearborn, where most of the Arab kids and the Mexicans live. And uh, downstairs, they you know, have the boxing room, and upstairs they have this regular uh, sewing classes and square dancing, and just a regular community spot. But the little basement has became very famous because of the quality of the fighters that have come in there. And Ray Leonard trained there in 76 in order to qualify for the Olympic team, and uh, George Foreman has trained there. And most of the great fighters of the last 30 years, Muhammad Ali, they've all trained at the Crunk Gym. And Tommy, why did you walk through those doors of the Crunk Gym all those years ago? Why boxing? Um, boxing was just a, a, something that I grew to love by watching boxing on TV, watching my favorite, which was Mom Ali, um, watching him fight and um, seeing how gratefully he done it, that it was able to do boxing. And I just wanted to paddle myself after, after Muhammad Ali and um, I've trained for maybe, um, I would say about 10 years, no, about, about six years before I met Emmanuel um, at a gym called King Solomon. And King Solomon was the gym that I started at, um, which um, everything really, really got me halfway prepared for boxing. And once I met Emmanuel, and I decided I want to go to Crunk after my train, I started training uh, fighters, so I decided I want to go to Crunk. And I talked to Emmanuel, and Emmanuel walked me in, and you know, I uh, started training, and started teaching me different things, and I started to improve. And <coughs> you said his idol was Muhammad Ali. When he first walked through the door, what were your impressions? Did you think you had another Ali on your hands? 
You know, Thomas was always a very, his biggest image was determination and consistency. He was always coming to the gym every day, he never missed a day. Thomas Hearns first came to the Kwan gym, the main thing that you noticed about him, he was something special, not necessarily in skills, because we had a lot of talented, you know, junior Olympic boxers at the time. But Thomas was special because he was so determined and so consistent. You could depend on him to be there every day, regardless of what the weather was. And he actually had to catch two buses to get to the gym. And he came from the totally opposite side of town. And uh, he was there, and he would, in the beginning, he won a couple of fights over guys who, at the time, had never even lost fights. And then he suffered a couple of bad decisions on the road, two of them in a row. But he was still right back in the gym the next day. And by the time that he hit 17, you could see him really fully evolving as a fighter because he lost, when he was only 16 years old, close decisions for the Olympic trial spot to Aaron Pryor, who was 19 now, about 20 years old at the time, a big political favorite, and also to Howard Davis. So these were big, big names, but at least he made it all the way to the finals then. And he'd also lost the decision to Ronnie Shields, who was a brilliant amateur fighter. But by the time that Thomas hit 17, he was fully developed into his full strength because each year he would move up a weight division, but he would also grow about two inches in height. So all of the growth was being absorbed by the, uh, uh, the height. So he never really got his strength. And when he was 17, he kind of stabilized in around six foot one. And everyone that he had lost two in the past that he got an opportunity to fight with again, he defeated, including knocking out Ronnie Shields, uh, who was the defending national champion. And tell me, that amateur career, as Emmanuel said, went from strength to strength. But how big a disappointment was it for you not to qualify for the 1976 Olympic team? Um, I was very disappointed with that because, it, you know, even though I fought a man that had a lot more experience, um, it didn't make me indifferent. I felt, really felt that, felt like I should have been there. I, I should have made the team. I was, felt like I was a bit of a big letdown to my country because I wasn't there um, fighting for my country. Um, it was hard. It was really hard at first. But Emmanuel talked to me, and Emmanuel just told me, said, well, don't worry about it. We just get ready, get ready to turn pro. So, you know, let's kind of hope it a little bit better, maybe a little better for me. Now, given what you went on to achieve as a professional, your amateur career, 155 wins out of 163 fights, but only 12 knockouts. I mean, <laughs> no, but it's about 12, about 12. I think about 12. It was more than, it was, it may not have given me very much credit, but it was more than seven, eight fights. Like, uh, come on. I, I, I knocked most of the guys out with just speed because we, so many punch, punch, so many punches together at one time. I was able to get so many, so many guys out, but you may be right. It took it took me a while to really start knocking out guys. I mean, once I once I came to the park and started uh, slowing down a little bit, stopped more placing the punches and learn how to put my my hip into the punches. I may not chop top me half my hip into the punches. Um, I started knocking more guys out. And what role did you play in unleashing that power? Because he knocked out his first 17 professional opponents. What role did you play in getting? Tommy to learn how to punch and use that vaunted right hand. Tommy Harris was always a very spirited, uh, intense performer. Uh, even when he lost the close decision to Aaron Pryor in the 76 National Golden Glove Finals in Miami, Angelo Dundee, who lived in Miami and who was present at the fights, uh, made a comment in the local paper the next day of all of the fighters who had participated, and it included Ray Leonard and most of the guys on the 76 Olympic team, he said he was more impressed with the 16-year-old kid from Detroit than any of his other fighters, and that was Thomas Hearns. But Thomas was a good amateur fighter, and just politically, not just uh, age-wise and strength-wise, politically, I mean, Howard Davis and Avon Pryor were the two top guys, so uh, regardless of what, he was not going to win any decisions over them. But nevertheless, when he turned professional, we focus a lot more on having punching power without changing his boxing techniques. That's why he became a great boxer puncher. And some of the guys that he fought, like uh, Ronnie Harris, I mean Ronnie Sh uh, Shields, Ronnie Shields, who Thomas fought as an amateur and had split two fights with, lost one decision and knocked Ronnie out later on, became a great 
uh, trainer, one of the top trainers in the game today, and Howard Davis, who not only won the spot of representing the United States in the Olympics, he also was named the most outstanding fighter in the 76 Olympics, but never did materialize as a good professional. So therefore, a lot of time guys who are great amateurs don't necessarily become great professionals. And that's what I explained to Thomas when he was so disappointed, he actually wanted to quit boxing after losing the decision with Howard Davis. And he just made it to the finals a few months before that lost the decision to Evan Pryor. But when he turned professional, we focused a lot on teaching him to tighten up at the end of the punches, a little bit more body weight, but still maintain his boxing skills. Then he went on to score 17 uh, knockouts, I think, before anyone went to the limit. And when he fought for the world championship, he made a top world-class champion look like a secondary opponent. And that's very unusual. Usually top fighters fight other top fighters. They win maybe by decision or systematically in late rounds or middle rounds, but very seldom do you see a guy come out and destroy a world champion the way that Thomas Hearns did when he fought for Peter Cuevas. What are your memories of that fight when you won the WBA title against Cuevas? Just 21 years old. And it's um, I just can remember being very happy. I remember just saying to myself, I made it. I finally made it. I made it to, to the pros, to the big time. Um, and that, those are the most memories that stood up in my mind. I said, man, I'm, I'm finally going to be able to do something with my life. I'm really finally going to be able to do something. And it just, it just blossomed like that. And, and then it just happened. And the right hand that effectively finished the fight, then, as Emmanuel said, a rock tough Mexican face first on the canvas. Right. Did you know instantly as soon as you landed that punch and that was it? Well, uh, before I landed the second right hand, I knew it was it. After I landed the first right, uh, right hand, I seen how shaky he was, how he was, wasn't having any control over his balance or anything. So then I, then I landed the second right hand, I knew it was over. And as Emmanuel said, you retained your boxing skills. Now you've developed this fearsome hitting power. And you had two nicknames because of that, the Motor City Cobra and the Hitman. Right. What's the difference in mindset between the Motor City Cobra and Thomas the Hitman Hearns? I, I, really, I really didn't have never thought about it like that. Um, I know that the Hitman is here to do a job. You know? And that's what I look at. I look at it as, this, as when I go to town, go to a town, I'm being paid to come there and take care of business. And that's what I do. I go there, I take care of my business, I pack my clothes, and I go home. And how would the Motor City Cobra approach it? Well, Motor City Cobra, I mean, they were, they were basically kind of similar because it's, it's still me. I mean, I would have done the same thing as being the Motor City Cobra, and then the same thing if I was the Hitman. If, if, if I decided not to take the Hitman use the Motor City Cobra, I still been doing the same thing. I've been get, I'm not. I'm not the type of guy that like to um, hang around when, my, when I finish taking care of my business. I mean, if I, I if I have to do something, I go and take care of my business, and then I walk away, go home, that's where I am. And that win over Cuevas paved the way for the unification bout with Sugar Ray Leonard. First super fight for both of you. How did you cope with the pressure? and the expectations with the whole city of Detroit going into that contest? I mean, there was something else first, and I'll come back since you're cutting it. Uh, first of all, Thomas Hearns was called the hitman because of the way he was knocking out so many people so quickly. And when he would fight on the road, Tommy always would like to take the, the red eye if possible. You know, he would, the fight would be over at 9, 30, 10 o'clock. If possible, Thomas would like to take a 12, 30 flight that night, or either the first thing in the morning at 5 o'clock. So that's how he got the name Hitman. And then the city of Detroit was getting uh, besieged with such a bad reputation at the time. We was a murder capital of the United States. And so the mayor of the city, uh, a local, with a local uh, civic leader named Jim Ingram, who was very close to us, they decided that maybe we should try to get away from the Hitman. And they, then the writers started calling them, at the recommendation of the city, uh, the Motor City Cobra. It lasted for about a year or so, and it went right back to the hitman because still that was Thomas's style of fighting. Goes so Cobra was just a, a snake or an animal, but it was nothing like the hitman, and there was more drama. So that's why the name went back to the hitman. Uh, but the uh, question that you had was about the. Uh, 
the expectation? Very, well, the first fight with Sugar Ray Leonard, which broke all records, was one of the highest uh, grossing fights at that time. And I think percentage-wise, they've shown for homes that was uh, available for pay-per-view and whatever, it was probably the highest to date percentage-wise, because nearly 50% of the people wanted to, to watch that fight, and it, which was amazing. That was dressed for a dress for TV. But anyway, the fight between Thomas Sands and Sugar Ray Leonard number one was an emotional fight that was probably, uh, at that time, the biggest fight in history. And what people didn't realize is that throughout the careers of both, even though Leonard was the gold medal winner, an extremely big popular fighter, that Ray Leonard trained at the Kronk Gym in 76 in order to win a spot on the Olympic team. And when he won the Olympic trials, the whole Kronk team was there cheering him on. He was our Kronk fighter. And uh, so then when he came back from the Olympics, and Tommy was winning his amateur national championship when he was 17, Ray Leonard was the first guy that had to congratulate him. When Thomas Hearns turned professional in his first professional fight, Ray Leonard came to Detroit and spent the whole uh, holiday season, which instead of being with his family, to help uh, promote Thomas' first fight. And then when Ray Leonard was training to fight a guy named Floyd Mayweather Sr., uh, Dave Jacobs, who was a trainer of Ray Leonard, asked could Tommy come and help box with Ray, because Tommy said he had about three professional fights at the time, and it was just 18. And so Tommy went and spared with Ray Leonard, and Dave Jacobs called me up the day after they spared, because I sent him alone, because that's how close we were. And Dave Jacobs said, Emmanuel, you know, it was a big crowd at the workout, and surprisingly, Tommy outboxed Ray Leonard. And we were surprised, because he's so young, and, you know, and nobody outboxes Ray. So the relationship had been there for many years, which people didn't understand. So when Ray and Tommy fought, not only was it a big fight for the general public in the boxing world, but also it was like for our little small world, it was like bragging rights to the community because Ray Leonard was like a crunk fighter in his own way, which people didn't realize. And so the emotions was extremely high that night. And preparing for the fight, even in our camp, it was the first and only time that we had even emotional problems between us, Thomas and I. Thomas was so determined to be in great shape for that fight, knowing that it was uh, going to be like the fight of his life, that he was actually running in the morning and then running in the evening sometimes. And that, and this, just training so hard and so determined to be in good shape that in that case we actually overtrained. And uh, coming into the fight, everyone was shocked when Thomas, who had normally been considered a very big welterweight, and normally the day of the fight, he would normally would wake up about 150 pounds, 51, and maybe just take a little jog or spin or something and try to just barely make the 47. For the fight with Ray Leonard, he came in, went 145 pounds, didn't do anything, probably woke up that morning at 145, didn't even want to check his weight earlier, and came in underweight. And it was a type of a fight that really what you call a classic because each time one guy would start taking the lead, the other guy would come right back the next round. It was just two guys who just had greatness inside. And then just before the fight started, the very last newspaper headlines was Hearn's favorite. Thomas Hearns became the favorite just before the fight because of the people from Detroit coming in and actually betting money. It got to be a really, really big bet fight between the Detroit people who were so emotionally involved with Thomas that uh, they came in and they bet, whereas very seldom you get a fighter who was so identified with a city the way that Thomas was. You know, you had, you know, and, you know Ray Leonard was from maybe Maryland, but nobody was identified. When you saw Tommy, you saw the word Detroit. And people was betting their loans against their homes, everything. So it was an emotionally high city. Hearns was a favorite at the last minute going into the fight. And after being hurt in the sixth round, well, a good little short punch combination exchange, he survived, came back, and was winning the fight again, and I think around about the 12th round or something, between uh, the rounds as I was talking to him, I could just like all of a sudden his head like dropped like it was like totally out of gas. He didn't have enough carbohydrates, enough body fat, anything to carry him. And I knew then the fight was over with him. It's the greatest fight that was gonna be in history for quite a while. And that's why, and you see how he was, you know, on the ropes and even when the fight concluded, he wasn't down, just in the ropes, and people said, why didn't you guys complain? You know, it was 
only maybe another round left. Uh, we never complained. It wasn't a case of that. He wasn't, when we went to the post-fight press conference, he's unmarked. But the idea was he just didn't have the energy or the strength to hardly walk back to his corner. And, you know, even though Ray Leonard came on strong, not trying to take anything away, if Thomas had been normal and came in at his normal weight and everything, Ray Leonard would not have been able to win the fight. But nevertheless, you can't take anything away from Ray. That's not his problem. He trained, he did what he was supposed to do, and realized he was losing, being outboxed. He came on strong, and Thomas didn't, at the same time, Thomas had totally just ran like you have enough petrol to get you from one city to another, but not enough to go any further. And, you know, unfortunate, it was a 15-round fight, not a 12-round fight. And therefore, we lost. And, you know, every time today, I look at that fight, it just it makes me sick. I don't like to watch it. I actually cried and had more pain than I've ever had in my life. Nothing personally, including death, and my family hurt me as much as that fight was. And I just, and then to wait eight years later and finally get the rematch, and Thomas comes out and encouraged everybody, once again shows he's a better fighter than Ray, beats him, knocks him down two times, and in the 11th round, near the end, instead of getting tired like the first fight, he puts Ray Leonard down again, only to hear the officials call it a draw. And that's the second biggest pain in my life. And, you know, after that, we just had to accept it. We didn't complain. And uh, we're still very close. At least I am very close with Ray Leonard today. And, and we've been there at a lot of functions together. And when he got married, the second marriage, we were the first guys there to spend time with him. And it was just a great, you know, trilogy that uh, a, a double, two fights at least. I wish we could have got the third. Ray did not want the second fight. And it took eight years to finally get him at $13 million to get him to fight the second fight, which he thought Thomas was finished at the time. And uh, definitely well, he would not entertain the idea of a third fight because in two fights, he still was, in terms of rounds, beaten by Thomas and always that box. How frustrating was it for you, Tommy, to have to wait so eight years before you could get Ray Leonard into a ring again? Um, <laughs> It was very, it was very uh, frustrating for me because um, I wanted so badly to redeem myself, um, to go back in there and fight Ray and um, come out victorious this time. And the more he put it off, the more he put it off, the kid put it off, kept putting it off, the more I had already decided about my mind wasn't going to happen. It just wasn't going to happen. And then Finally, in, in 1989, he decided that he was going to fight. Even when he said he was going to fight, I still didn't believe it. I still, I still didn't believe it. But I, I trained. I trained hard for the fight because just in case it was true, I want to be ready for, for when the day come by. And the day came, and Ray was there. I was, I was still like, I was still, I was still in somewhat of a shock. But I went on. I did what I was supposed to do. I had that I trained. I trained every day for the fight, uh, like it was gonna happen, and um, it did happen. When it happened, I was, I was just a happy person, because I know that Ray could have pulled out at, at any time. But you no, know, being being the fight business, you have to know that anything something that happened at any time, he could have said he got it. Uh, a cut, got injured, and they called the fight off. But the fight went through, and I was very happy about that. I mean, I I wouldn't think about anything more thing, anything else negative, besides was the fight really gonna happen or not. As you say, you went into the second fight looking for redemption after waiting those eight long years. Was you dominated him throughout the fight, put him on the canvas twice. Was that enough? Did that satisfy your redemption? Or did you need to see it reflected in the scorecard? Because ultimately, the judges called it a draw. Well, you know, you always need to see it in, in the scorecard with the judges because those are the people who let you know where you win or you lose. And not not getting the victory, to me, it was like, you know, it was like a letdown, but, but I knew in my heart, and people knew who won that fight. And that meant a lot to me, too. So, I mean, I had to deal with that. I had to go through life now just knowing that uh, the second fight, I did win, but I didn't get the decision. If we just go back in time to the first fight, your first loss as a professional, what are your memories of that night 
against Sugar Ray Leonard the first time around? I really didn't know how to accept it because being a winner, a winner just don't quit, just keep going. And and when I lost, like the worst thing in the world could have happened to me. And I was down on myself for a while. I didn't know what to do, how to think. I know I won't be want to be bothered with the public anymore because I felt like I let the public down. I didn't want to go outside to be approached by anybody because I knew what the public public had to say to me. You know, it's just I guess I always said that you can't you shouldn't you have never criticize yourself. Because you are, you're gonna always be the worst criticism to yourself. You're gonna make the worst criticism to yourself. So don't criticize yourself. It's okay if somebody else criticizes you. But when you start criticizing yourself, you bring yourself down. You bring yourself way down. So then you regrouped, moved up to 154, secured a title against Wilfred Benitez. Yeah. And then came perhaps a career defining win against Roberto Duran when you knocked him spark out in two rounds, which nobody else had been able to do. Right. Why were you so confident that going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Roberto Duran would make you the victor when Sugar Ray Leonard tried it and came out on the wrong end of a points verdict the first time around? Well, I knew myself that Roberto probably wouldn't be able to send some more punching power. And once I, get, once I was able to get one good punch in, I knew I had a chance to really turn, the fight, turn it around. And when I was able to hit Roberto, and Roberto felt my strength, I seen Roberto then start back powering. And that's, you, know, you, don't never, you never ever see Roberto back powering. Roberto did not want to come in and mix it up with me. You know, because of the ego, he tried to stay there. But his ego, when a person has an ego, and sometimes it gets in the way of what he really should do or what he shouldn't do. And it kind of got in the way with him. And he just stood there, and he just and he took the wrong shot. That right hand that you landed, where does that rank among all the shots that you've delivered throughout your career? Um, it was just a, uh, a punch where Roberto really didn't see it because it came from a different angle. The angle it came from was like I was going to the body, but I decided not to go to the body and go right to the head. And he was not expecting that. He was expecting it to be a body shot, but it actually, in reality, it was, it was a head shot. It was supposed to be a head shot. Was that the strategy, Emmanuel, to go in and boss Roberto Duran? No, the strategy going into the fight with Roberto Duran was to, like I have most of my tall fighters when they fight a short guy, to be physical. They expect the tall guy to always be, you know, running and trying to utilize his strength. But uh, much like Lennox Lewis later on did the same thing with Mike Tyson, he was very physical with him, pushing him around, pulling him, and making him back up, putting pressure all the time. And whenever the shorter guy starts to come forward, just take a half a step back, just enough to keep that distance, and then to keep putting pressure. And most short guys start falling apart then. They don't, they're not expecting it. But Thomas's hand speed really bothered uh, Duran in addition to Thomas's punching power. He never had anyone that punch with such speed that had power also. And that coupled with the height and the, the pressure that Thomas was putting on him was just too much for him to deal with. And uh, at the end of the first round, he also felt Thomas' strength when Thomas threw him down uh, and cut him over his eye, and it was just too much for him. And Thomas fought a perfectly executed uh, fight. And he had such good sparring going into the fight, too. His sparring sessions was with Mark Breland, who was only about two months sh shy of winning a gold medal Olympic. Mike McCallum, who was about four months shy of being a uh, world champion also. Uh, Frank Tate, who was a gold medal winner in the Olympics. So that type of a sparring on a guy from uh, uh, over here that was a member of our crunk team, Earl Christie. So he had tremendous sparring going into that. So compared to the speed of those guys, Roberto Duran, who had just fought a really great and uh, close decision loss fight to marvelous Marvin Hagler, uh, he, he just couldn't compete to with Thomas and Nikos. You know, I've always believed at the Kronk that we have great 
spam. We don't try to use spam partners. We use other top fighters. And uh, that raises your game. And in this case, your Thomas was just too much of everything for Roberto Duran that night. So then, with you having just knocked out Roberto Duran in two rounds, as you say, taken Marvelous Marvin the distance, the clamor was intense for you to have a middleweight showdown with Marvelous Marvin. Now, there was a lot of trash talk during the press tour building up for that fight. How genuine was any bad blood between yourself and Marvin Hagler? Um, I think to start off, um, before we got to really know each other, there wasn't, the blood between me and Marvin wasn't so good. I mean, it wasn't a good thing because we are really getting ready to go up against each other, fight each other. And when you're about to fight somebody, you don't, you don't like that person. <laughs> I mean, I never liked nobody I was going to fight in the streets, you know. Um, it's just like a street fight to me. I, I got to take care of myself, and he got to take care of himself, you see. And and I basically was just had the thought of, hey, you trying to take away something that I, that I worked hard to earn, to get myself. And in order for me to keep that, I got to go out there. I got to do a good job on you, you know. And that was my thought, to go out there and, and put a good whooping on Marvin. And Emmanuel, after the fantastic training camp that you had, you said that Tommy only needed six weeks to get ready. But then the day of the fight, all of that was put into jeopardy by one of Tommy's entourage. Tell us what happened in that respect. Well, Thomas trained very hard for the fight with uh, Marvelous Marvin Hagler. In fact, we trained uh, seven weeks. But we normally, Tommy only trained five weeks, believe it or not. I found out it was best for him. Training too long for tall fighters, especially when they don't have weight problems, it's, it's not good, in my opinion. Then uh, he was looking fine, excellent. I just felt no way Marvin Hagler could not box Tommy. And just for pure punching power, Tommy was a better puncher. And uh, just before we were going to go down to the arena, I had to go downstairs to deal with a problem that was going on in the lobby. And when I come back, all of these friends from Detroit were just all packed in the room. They all coming to support Tommy. And when I came back up to the room, one of them was up there, two of them really, massaging Thomas's legs while he was sitting there watching the, uh, they were all watching some kung fu movies. And I just went berserk, made everybody get out of the room, and Tommy didn't fully understand why. You know, so massage is what you get after an event. It leaves the muscles spent and limp, and there's no snap. And so shortly after that, Thomas started to uh, get ready to go, and as he was getting his robe and stuff out of the closet, he said, man, my legs feel so weak. And, you know, I looked at Prentice Bird, who was my vice president. I mean, we knew what it was. And here we were going into one of the biggest fights in history. Once again, we have handicapped ourselves. And with, nobody wants to hear any excuses. So we get down to the ring. And if you even look at the, I think when he came in the ring, even, I think you see him even stumble the trip, getting the ropes or something. He just has legs. And then to top it all off, Marvin fought the perfect fight. Marvin realizing it, just as I said, he could outbox a Tommy Harris and punch a punch, he could not really compete with Thomas. He tried to make it a brawl, tucked his chin into his chest where he could maximize his neck strength and tried to keep his head out to where Tommy would have to hit him more in the forehead area and just took a gamble and came in and it was just an all-out pure six brawl and people said, why did Thomas box? He really couldn't because of his leg situation. But nevertheless, uh, he comes back at the end of the first round and I'm about to have a heart attack because I knew his legs was not going to hold up. Uh, and then when he sits down, the first thing he says, my right hand is broke. I said, oh, my God. we got 14 more rounds to go at, th at this pace here with bad legs and a broken right hand. But the thought of quitting or stopping the fight never entered my mind, but just knowing Thomas's mental makeup. So Thomas went out there and gave the crowd two more of the most brutal rounds in history. And if you would look... The right hands after the first round where he staggered Marvin, he was actually kind of slinging the right hand. He really wasn't punching it straight anymore because it was broken. And he was trying to, with bad legs and just one left hand, he was generally just battle as we say back in Detroit, you know, if you're going to go out, you're going to go out like a warrior. And he fought all the way until he finally went down and out. And after the fight, when we were in the dressing room, you know, he said it very clear. Nor anyone mention anything about my broken hand when we go to out of legs, when we go to the press conference. And really just in recent years, I've just said it on my own because he never wanted to be known. 
And uh, we go into the press conference. He just starts laughing with the crowd, telling them he hoped they enjoyed the fight. Congratulated Marvin, you know, say you knocked me out. I've knocked out a lot of people before. I know how it feels. And and afterwards we left, and his hand was broken so bad that the actual bone was almost penetrating through the skin. So we had to try to wrap it up tightly, give him pain pills, and got back to Detroit. He didn't want anybody to see it in Las Vegas, and had him have surgery on his hand. And you know, just to think that the three of the most exciting rounds maybe in boxing history he fought under the conditions made me have a lot more respect for him and the fact that he never, ever, ever wanted it to be known to the public. And you can't take away from Marvin, though, because Marvin did what he was supposed to do, and Marvin had a bad gash over his forehead, and the referee was about to stop the fight then, and Marvin just fought with such intensity. That's why, you know, all of us have so much respect for Marvin Hagler with what he did, you know. And the problems that you have in your own camp, you know, you, it's, it's your problem. It's, it's not his problem. When that fight started round one, the two of you stalked around and clashed in ring center. The right hand that you hit him with right at the start of that fight, which really shook him up, but he weathered the storm. What did you think when you landed one of your best shots, but he weathered it? Well, quite actually, I thought it was going to be a long night. It's going to be a long <laughs> night. You know, so, uh, there's not too many guys that can, can really take uh, my right hand, a good shot for me for, with the right hand. And when he accepts that shot and then really hard and stagger very much, I said, man, this is, I got I to gotta find something else to hit this man with because he cares nothing about the right hand. The right hand is not hard enough. You know, I can, I know I couldn't put no more pressure. Cause like the first hard shot I hit him, I hit him right on the top of the head, and it hurt my hand. I said, "Oh man, I just, I just went to prayer, went to prayer and, and fighting, just praying and fighting." But I knew I had to fight. If I'm gonna be there, I had to fight. I mean, I couldn't just stop and not give the audience a show. The audience deserved a show that night. And that's what I was there for. I was there to put on a great show. And I gave him my all. I gave him everything that I had. Is that the two losses that you suffered to Ray Leonard and then Marvin Hagler elevated you in the eyes of the boxing public because you did put on such a brave performance on both occasions? Is that more important to you almost than winning a bad fight? Or would you rather lose no, at all times? No, I don't want to lose nothing. I don't like losing. Losing just upsets me so badly that I, that I can't really focus on doing anything else. I got to get back in there and redeem myself. But my thought is that when I go out there, it's, it's, it's more so than, than pleasing myself. It's pleasing my fans first. I, so I know if I please them, then I'm, I'm all right. I'm, all, I'm okay. So it's, it's about pleasing the people who paid the big money to see me perform. If I'm performing good and they're happy to go home and they talk about it, I'm happy. Of all your achievements throughout your career, the titles, the championships at multiple weights, what is the most pleasing achievement to you, Tony Leonard? Um, I had a lot of pleasing moments in my life. The most pleasing moment to me probably was 1980 winning the first, my first title because it meant so much to me. Uh, having that first title uh, was something that I dreamed about, being a world champion one day. And then when I achieved that, it, it just felt like I had the whole world in my hands. You know? And I always give thanks back to, at first I give thanks to my Heavenly Father Jesus Christ, but then, then I think, my training, Emmanuel, because Emmanuel was the person that helped me get there. Uh, Emmanuel, Emmanuel always thought that Emmanuel can get you there, will get me there, but it'd be up to me to do the bit, take care of the job. So I, I'll ask Emmanuel to is just get me in the position, put me in the position, and I'll take it from there. And Emmanuel has that much belief in me that I would go in there, regardless of what, what the situation may be, I would go in there and I, I would take care of my business. You know, so many men have so much confidence in each other as far as 
of our ability to do something. It may know what I expect from him, and I know what he may expect from me. So we have something. We have we have a bond here that, even though we've been together for a long time, we still know our capabilities, each other's capabilities, and. I can look at Emmanuel sometimes, and I can know something's troubling Emmanuel. And when I'm in a fight, I look at Emmanuel, and Emmanuel says, just tell me, look, you got to go out there, and you got to stop. You got to take care of it. You got you to go out there, and you got to really box. That's how Emmanuel talks, talks to me. And I know he's upset about my performance, and that's when I turn it on. Uh, it's time to turn it on, turn it up a notch or two, maybe, and and get the job done. And when we do that, we are probably the most two happiest guys in the world together when it's done. I, I'm, I'm referring to Emmanuel as just my trainer, but for all along, from the start, Emmanuel has been my manager and trainer. So... Uh, certain thing I look at Emmanuel because of he's my manager, he's supposed to do. And he knows what he's supposed to do. I don't have to tell him. You know, and then another thing, another, another way I look at in a trainer manner, when, when I need to know a certain thing or how to do a certain thing, I look at him to teach me how to do it, to show me the proper way. Tommy says you're his manager and trainer, but your relationship seems so much more than that, so much deeper than that. Why is your relationship with Tommy? Because he really wants to be my dad, but he can't <laughs> be my dad. <laughs> uh, you know, Tommy, there will never be another Tommy in my life. And it's uh, not only we've, we've been together over about 30, over 30 some years now. And we, we, yeah, 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 I know. Yeah, yeah, time, time, I know. We've been old. You are old and I'm old, so let's face that. Speak for yourself. <laughs> but, uh, no, uh, we've been together over 30 years. And uh, also, and you look at the fact that he was like the first, you know, like the first. He And he was a guy that was, you know, we both grew together. You know, there wasn't that much difference in our age. And so I was really growing when he was growing. And, when we went into the professional fight and we went into the professional fight together, I was, didn't realize I was making my debut as a manager and uh, as he was time he was turning professional. And I also, uh, he was the first one that was like, that opened up the door because all of the other kids followed Tommy's pattern. And that's how we had the McCroys and the Dwayne Thomas and the Jimmy Pauls and the Steve McCroy and Milton McCroy and all of them. And uh, throughout the years, you know, you get where you almost can think of, like I could actually be sitting in the corner and I had certain punches and moves that I wanted him to make and I could just sit there and, and he would start doing them just like it was like a psychic connection that you, you develop after so many years together. But also Tommy, I would say, not only was my favorite fighter by, by no means is anyone even that close to him, believe it or not, all of the champions I worked with, but Thomas was to me my favorite fighter also as a fan. That because, you know, the time he was a guy who had tremendous skills, never lost his boxing skills, uh, tremendous punching power. You know, very seldom when guys get to a certain level, the eat like level, you don't see a Hagler or Leonard or none of those guys knocking someone out early. I mean, it's a systematic fight. You fight long fights, you may win a decision. But Thomas Heron is one of the few fighters who could go out and, and knock out a guy like a Duran, who never was knocked out ever in his whole career. That was with Leonard and Hagler involved, and knocked him out, and, and so early and knocked him down the first round. Was uh, did James Shuler, a fighter who had never been defeated, and Thomas knocked him out in the very first round with his gloves still up in position. He went between the gloves, knocked him out, knocked out Papino Quavers. So and then he knocked out guys in brutal fights like Juan Rodan, in a fight that was going back and forth. Uh, so as a fan, I was excited about going down the aisle with Thomas Hearns as also the manager and his trainer and as a fan because the one thing you know when you left the dressing room with Thomas, he was going to give you 100%. You were going to see some boxing skills and, if, and you're going to see punching power. And if it has to go out to being a, just a plain fight on just a determination, he was going to fight until there was nothing left. And so I was just totally excited about being a part of his career because 
you know, to me, still been the most exciting fighter that I've saw that ran from all the way really the late 70s all the way up to, I remember in 2000, uh, he was still fighting good. In 1993, Thomas had been off about two years maybe from having hand surgery to repair his hand permanently. And I was training in Vander Holyfield for the second fight with Riddick Bow when he won the title back. And also part of the Riddick Bow camp was a fighter named Andrew Vader, who was the Olympic gold medal winner and who they was grooming as the next superstar. So they asked uh, Thomas Hearns to fight him and uh, as a cruiserweight. And I said, okay. So that night I had Thomas Hearns fighting, a big underdog fight, as well as Evander Holyfield against Riddick Bow. And uh, Thomas fighting as a cruiserweight comes out and knocks out Andrew Maynard in the very first round. I mean, doing the same thing that he'd been doing since he was, you know, a just turned 18. And that to me is amazing for a guy who not only was still scoring upsets, but maintaining his punch, which everybody says as you grow up, you lose your punch. Thomas Hearns was a great puncher and boxer from welterweight all the way to cruiserweight. And I don't think there's any man in history I've saw that's ever did that. And so just as a fan, I mean, I'm a big Tommy Hearns fan. Tommy, you form part of one of the greatest eras in boxing, along with Marvin Hagler, Sugar Ray Leonard, Roberto Duran. If we could just play word association for a moment. If I mention their name, you tell me what comes to mind. Sugar Ray Leonard. Hurting. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's kind of tough for me to say that, but, you know, Ray Leonard, Ray Leonard, so I've been in the shower of Ray Leonard for many, many years, you know. It's just... Uh, Ray Ray has always wanted to be bigger, better in everything we do, and and I I sort of I sort of really really disagree. You know I don't know he knows that, that I can beat that I beat him and he beat me I know that but I don't think that he's so much greater than I am. And I don't think I'm so much greater than him. You know, I think that as you really look at it, it looks pretty even to me. Roberto Duran. One of the greatest fighters. Uh, this man was one of the greatest lightweights there were in the world. Marvelous Marvin Hagler. Cool. Cool guy. Nice guy. He's um, he set his way. He just laid back. He, he's... He doesn't say say very much, but as you be around him, you know how he's thinking. Thomas Hearns. I'm a man that likes to get the job done, and I can. I know that I can't get the job done. Whatever, whatever you put in front of me, and you may think it may be a very difficult task for me to do to take care of it, to accomplish, but I make it look easy. Now, Tommy today is a superstar, a legend, wherever he goes, and. The Kronk has been associated with so many great champions, but it's had more than its fair share of misfortune and tragedy. Why do you think it is that guys who are so dedicated and talented and disciplined in the ring couldn't keep their life, their personal life together outside of the gym? Super bad Mays and Ricky well, Mac. And we've had probably more successes than any other boxing club, and especially when we look at it, it's running over the 35 years now. And uh, I, what do you call it, uh, tenacity or whatever, because we've survived a lot. And we've had more drama. A lot of the uh, guys who are you know, being murderers and dissonant and bank robbers. And, and in fact, they have a TV series that's going to be coming out called The Crunk, similar to The Sopranos. It'll be based in covering all the other aspects. And Thomas was one of the guys who uh, had a very good straight life and never been in any trouble, never smoked, drank, never been in any scandal. I don't think ever even had a point taken from him even in a fight uh, or even a warning for Harley for doing anything or doing a fight that was illegal. But uh, the reason that we've had so much in one direction such as a negative and a positive fact that we've just had more boxers involved. I mean that we've had when you have enough of anything you're going to have some drama more than someone who has maybe five or six fighters. But uh, we've had hundreds of fighters in box for Kronk, so as a result, we got a lot of very good dramatic and uh, negative stories with murders and whatever, and we've had great success stories. Now, with all those boxes coming through the doors of the Kronk, 
who, in your estimation, is the best fighter that the world never got to see? Well, the kid who had the potential to be the best fighter that uh, ever came to the club was a kid named Bernard Mays. But uh, I look at it a little different than everyone else. See, Bernard Mays was like the first little junior Olympic boxer I had. At the time when all of my boxers joined the Marines, when I had a Golden Gloves team, I had no one at the gym, so it was a little kid that was 11 years old that I uh, caught one day he was going swimming. And I told him I was going to make him be a little boxer. And um, he didn't have a choice, really. <laughs> and I taught him how to box. So I spent almost a year with him alone. And I've never, ever had the time to totally involve myself with one fighter like I did with Bernard Mays. So he learned every trick in the book. I mean, he could study your movements, your rhythm, and position of your feet, and punch in between your movements where you couldn't even block the punches and take advantage of those things. And then as a result of his success and notoriety, we had uh, Thomas Hearns and the Milton McCrory and all of the other little kids wanted to come because it was known that the best little junior boxer was a kid named Bernard Mays that everybody in the whole city was going crazy over. And he had so much talent, but I don't necessarily all the time give him that much credit for talent because he had my undivided attention for almost a year. And he developed into a very, very fine fighter. And then Thomas and the rest of them come, they come at the time when it was like, it was part of a group then. So they never got that individual attention that Bernard Mays got. But it shows that you cannot tell who's gonna be the star when your kids are little because Bernard Mays at the age of 33 was dead because he became an alcoholic and he had died from alcohol. And a lot of the other very super talented kids that came along, they got caught up in the drugs. Some of them got caught up in just romantic situations where they just couldn't get over that. Some just could not deal with success alone. They just went to their heads. Thomas was the one who survived all of those tests and prevailed and became the legendary fighter and was the guy that became the real big first superstar, but the most talented guy that most people consider was Bernard Mays. But I don't put that much emphasis on it as other people because he got so much of my time and, uh, and also the fact that he didn't pass those other tests. Because to be great in anything, you have to have a lot of other qualities such as discipline, which is in any, any sport. And in boxing, you gotta have a lot of courage and uh, you have to have the ability to deal with success and you're gonna have to deal with these other obstacles that you will eventually uh, come in contact with as you grow, which is such as uh, the, the drugs, the alcohol, and the romance. And uh, those are the tests that very few guys would pass, and Thomas was one of the few that passed him, and he went on to become a great fighter with just good talent. But he was never a, a, a lack of talent, but he had good talent, but he, he preserved and made himself become great. And Thomas, the Hearns name, lives on in the boxing ring through your son, Ronald. Yes. But you know how tough a game boxing is. When he first came to you and said, Dad, I want to be a boxer, what was your reaction? No. <laughs> Just straight out, no. Because um, I knew what he was going to have to face. So I, well, he was young, he was very, when he first came to join, I think he was about, same, well, he was about, when he was younger than I was, well, older than I was when I first came to join. He was about 12, 13, you are 12 years old. And, and I told him, I said, no, I don't want you to box. I really don't want you to box. I said, what I really want from you is you to get your education. And, and he told me, okay, Dad, but he wasn't really happy about that. He really wanted, but I want to box. I said, no, no, no. And then um, now, after he finished his getting his education, went to school and went to college and graduated from college and um, then he, down, I think a few weeks later, he went, started going to the gym. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know he was going to the gym until maybe a month, a month and a half after he was born, that I found out he was going to the gym. And I said, fine, fine, son. You, you, did, you did what I asked you to do. It's all, you, it's all done, it's over with now. So I have nothing to say. If that's what you want to do with your life, then you're welcome to do it. So tell me, what do you think your legacy is? as a boxer, how would you like to be remembered? Uh, I basically really, really need to think about it because one thing which I probably won't have to say that people gonna remember me as probably one of the, one of the best punches out there in, in, in the boxing business. Um, I uh, also hope that they can also remember me as being one of the greatest, great, 
not, well, not great, but a very good boxer as well. Uh, I know they're going to gonna always remember me as being a puncher, but they have to remember me as being a, a good boxer. Thomas Hearns, Emmanuel Stewart, one of the greatest double acts in boxing. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much yeah, for your time. I can enjoy talking to someone that's so knowledgeable about the Kronk history. <laughs>